I've been reading Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, and I'd like to read you a passage from chapter 15, entitled The Marriage of Science and Empire. How far from the sun, how far is the sun from the earth? It's a question that intrigued many early modern astronomers, particularly after Copernicus argued that the sun, rather than the earth, is located at the center of the universe. A number of astronomers and mathematicians tried to calculate the distance, but their methods provided widely varying results. A reliable means of making the measurement was finally proposed in the middle of the 18th century. Every few years, the planet Venus passes directly between the Sun and the Earth. The duration of the transit differs when seen from distant points on the Earth's surface. Because of the tiny difference in the angle at which the observer sees it, if several observations of the same transit were made from different continents, simple trigonometry was all it would take to calculate our distance from the Sun. Astronomers predicted that the next Venus transit would occur in 1761 and 1769. So expeditions were sent from Europe to the four corners of the world in order to observe the transits from as many distant points as possible. In 1761, scientists observed the transit from Siberia, North America, Madagascar, and South Africa. As the 1769 transit approached, the European scientific community mounted a supreme effort, and scientists were dispatched as far as northern Canada and California which was then a wilderness. The Royal Society of London for the Improvement of Natural Knowledge concluded that that was not enough. To obtain the most accurate results, it was imperative to send an astronomer all the way to the southwestern Pacific Ocean. The Royal Society resolved to send an eminent astronomer, Charles Green, to, to Tahiti, and spared neither effort nor money. But since it was funding such an expensive expedition, it hardly made sense to use it to make just a single astronomical observation. Green was therefore accompanied by a team of eight other scientists from several disciplines, headed by botanist Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander. The team also included artists assigned to produce drawings of the new lands, plants, animals, and peoples that the scientists would no doubt encounter. Equipped with the most advanced scientific instruments that Banks and Royal Society could buy, the expedition was placed under the command of Captain James Cook, an experienced seaman as well as an accomplished geographer and ethnographer. The expedition left England in 1768, observed the Venus transit from Tahiti in 1769, reconnoitered several Pacific islands, visited Australia and New Zealand, and returned to England in 1771. It brought back enormous quantities of astronomical, geographical, meteorological, botanical, zoological, and anthropological data. Its findings made major contributions to a number of disciplines, sparked the imaginations of Europeans in astonishing tales of the South Pacific, and inspired future generations of naturalists and astronomers. One of the fields that benefit, benefited from the Cook expedition was medicine. At the time, ships that set sail to distant shores knew that more than half of their crew members would die on the journey. The nemesis was not angry natives, enemy warships, or homesickness. 
It was a mysterious ailment called scurvy. Men who came down with the disease grew lethargic, depressed, and their gums and other soft tissues bled. As the disease progressed, their teeth fell out. Open sores appeared, and they grew feverish, jaundiced, and lost control of their limbs. Between the 16th and 18th centuries, scurvy is estimated to have claimed the lives of about 2 million sailors. No one knew what caused it, and no matter what remedy was tried, sailors continued to die in droves. The turning point came in 1747 when the British physician James Lind conducted a controlled experiment on sailors who suffered from the disease. He separated them into several groups and gave each of, the different, each of them a different treatment. One of the test groups was instructed to eat citrus fruits, a common folk remedy for scurvy. The patients in this group promptly recovered. Lind did not know what the citrus, citrus fruits had that the sailors' bodies lacked, but he now, but we now know that it is vitamin C. A typical shipboard diet at the time was notably lacking in foods that are rich in this essential nutrient. On long-range voyages, sailors usually subsisted on biscuits and beef jerky and ate almost no fruits or vegetables. The Royal Navy was not convinced by Lynn's experiments, but James Cook was. He resolved to prove the doctor right. He loaded his boat with a large quantity of sauerkraut and ordered his sailors to eat lots of fresh fruits and vegetables whenever the expedition made landfall. Cook did not lose a single sailor to scurvy. In the following decades, all the world's navies adopted Cook's nautical diet, and the lives of countless sailors and passengers were saved. However, the Cook expedition had another far less benign result. Cook was not only an experienced seaman and geographer, but also a naval officer. The Royal Society financed a large part of the expedition's expenses, but the ship itself was provided with the Royal Navy. The Navy also seconded 85 well-armed sailors and marines and equipped the ship with artillery, muskets, gunpowder, and other weaponry. Much of the information collected by the expedition, particularly the astronomical, geographical, meteorological, and anthropological data, was of obvious political and military value. The discovery of an effective treatment for scurvy greatly contributed to British control of the world's oceans and the ability to send armies to the other side of the world. Cook himself claimed for Britain many of the islands and the lands he discovered, most notably Australia. The Cook expedition laid the foundation for the British occupation of the southwestern Pacific Ocean for the conquest of Australia, Tasmania, and New Zealand. For the settlement of millions of Europeans in the new colonies and for the extermination of their native cultures and most of their native populations. In the century following the Cook expedition, the most fertile lands of Australia and New Zealand were taken from the previous inhabitants by European settlers. The native population dropped by up to 90% and the survivors were subjected to harsh regime of racial oppression for the Aborigines of Australia and the Maoris of New Zealand, the Cook Exposition was the beginning of a catastrophe from which they have never recovered. An even worse fate befell the natives of Tasmania. 
having survived for 10,000 years or more. In splendid, splendid isolation, they were almost exterminated within a century, within a century of Cook's arrival. European settlers first drove them off the richest part of the land, and then, coveting even the remaining wilderness, hunted them down and killed them systematically. Some of the last survivors were hounded into an evangelical concentration camp where well-meaning but not particularly open-minded missionaries tried to indoctrinate them in the ways of the modern world. The Tasmanians were instructed in reading and writing Christianity and various productive skills, such as sewing clothes and farming. But they refused to learn. They became ever more melancholic, stopped having children, lost all interest in life, and finally chose the only escape route from the modern world of science and progress, death. Alas, science and progress pursued them even to the afterlife. The corpses of dead Tasmanians were seized in the name of science by anthropologists and curators. They were dissected, weighed, and measured, and analyzed in learned articles. The skulls and skeletons, the skulls and skeletons were then put on display in museums and anthropological collections. Only in 1976 did the Tasmanian Museum give up for burial the skeleton of Truganini, often thought to be the last full-blooded native Tasmanian who had died a hundred years earlier. The English Royal College of Surgeons held on to the samples of her skin and hair until 2002. Was Cook's ship a scientific expedition protected by a military force or a military expedition with a few scientists tagging along? That's like asking whether your petrol tank is half empty or half full. It was both. The scientific revolution and modern imperialism were inseparable. People such as Captain James Cook and the botanist Joseph Banks could hardly distinguish science from empire, nor could luckless Truganini. 